We try so hard to, to move our little imaginary chess pieces around an imaginary board with an imaginary enemy and an imaginary winning strategy. And then when we, when we really see what we're doing and we settle back into just being in the flow of this extraordinary thing that we call life, this experiment, Ah, oh, something new occurs, something new. We see something new and there's something fresh and then off we go again. Underneath everything, all the pretending, all the ego, all the moods, all the everything, that we are pure potential, pure love, knowing that, like really knowing that means that the freedom to show up in the moment is always available to us when we notice that we don't, we don't have to put the filters on. Welcome to the Christina Crooks Show, where you not only get to know the many versions of moi, but also the rich tapestry of humanity. I invite you to bring your full curiosity and listen as we journey through people's stories and expertise. I hope you walk away with insights and inspiration and new possibilities bubbling up inside of your soul. The reason it's called the Christina Crooks Show is because here's the thing. I don't always wanna do the same thing. I like a variety in my life. I like to explore different rabbit holes and different people and different interests. So together in this podcast, that's exactly what we'll do. Have fun and we'll see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today with Lorna Davis. Lorna has served as president of multinational consumer goods companies for 20 plus years in Danone, Kraft, and Mondelez. She has been a key leader in Danone's purpose journey and is a global ambassador for the B Corp movement. In 2017, Lorna served as CEO and chairwoman of Danone Wave, now Danone North America, where she established that $6 billion entity as a public benefit corporation. And it achieved B Corp status in 2018 making it the largest B Corp in the world. Lorna is a member of the Social Mission Board of Seventh Generation, the Advisory Board of Radical Impact, and Goyaki, a Yerba Mate business. She's lived and led businesses in seven countries and is passionate about purpose in business, rhino conservation, and her dog, Stir Fry. Welcome, Lorna. Thanks, Christina. Good to be here. Oh, good to have you. We were speaking a little bit beforehand, and I'm so excited to see you, so excited to be in conversation and just see all the places we get to explore and the conversation we get to explore together in this conversation. So the very first thing I want to ask you is, how did Stir Fry get his name? <laughs> Actually, that's a good story about the world and of the change that I have had in consciousness around uh, white supremacy, in fact. So let me start there. So Stir Fry was found on the street in Shanghai when I lived in Shanghai. And a friend of mine's driver found him. He was small and uh, sort of, you know, flea infested and under a car and there was nobody else around. And she didn't want him. And so I fell in love with him instantly. And that night while we were trying to work out what to name him, there was some sort of banter about how Chinese people eat dogs um, as we eat. Uh, I don't because I'm a vegan, but how human people in the West eat all manner of animals and um, Chinese people eat dogs. And so we said, well, if I didn't rescue him, somebody would eat him and therefore the name stir fry came up we thought it was hilarious it became his name so for years I would tell the story that's 2009 I would tell the story and then a couple of years ago a young Chinese woman took me on on that uh on that story and she said 
you are you're being inappropriately disrespectful to sort of Asian uh, prejudice. And I started off kind of defending my story because I said to her, well, I am a vegan actually. And I often use this introduction as a kickoff when people say, oh my God, Chinese people, you, you know, eat dogs. I often say, well, you eat pigs, cows, whatever it is that you eat. And so what's the difference? And I thought that was a pretty good defense. You know, it's kind of neat. And she said to me, do you do that every time you introduce that story? And I said, no, I don't, because I don't have that kind of time every time somebody asks me why he's called stir fry. So she said, well, the times that you don't, that you just tell the first part of the story and you don't engage in a proper conversation about veganism, you're just basically embedding this simple narrative about this inelegance and, and behavior of, of an entire continent, effectively. And I realized she's right. She's right. It had come a kind of a trope that made me laugh, made other people laugh, and potentially at the expense of other people's prejudice. So now when people ask me why he's called stir fry, I say because he's a mixture, you know, he's a, he's a mashup of many breeds, uh, which is what a stir fry is. And people accept that and we move on. So it's actually been a really interesting lesson for me around how I've kind of held on to these little stories because they amuse me um, or they amuse other people without thinking about, you know, about the potential implications for an entire continent. So yeah, it was cool. It was a really good, it was a really good lesson to me. I was very defiant at the beginning and very, you know, pleased with myself. And I mean, I'm full of shit in a whole bunch of areas. And that, and that was just one of them really. <laughs> and he's learning. And he's right here. Exactly. We're always learning. We're always learning. And the, the interesting thing about what you're sharing with that is how our language shifts as we grow and as we evolve. And it doesn't matter what age you are, it just matters. Are you constantly at your growth edge and looking, does this apply anymore? Is it okay to say these things? I remember I was having a friend watch one of the old SNL skits about the hyper hypo. And I used to laugh at that skit so much and she wasn't laughing. And I went, you don't think this is funny? And she had a special needs son. And she goes, no, because that was my life. Like I had to have my son on a harness because he would take off and he was hyper all the time. And he had all kinds of medical challenges that we had to work through. So no, none of that's funny to me. And I went, whoa. And I was so taken aback that sometimes it takes someone to go, actually, that's kind of offensive to me for you to go, well, let me. Let me reinvestigate. And at first I thought, how could you not think that's funny? But once someone explains it, I remember listening to Brene Brown a few years ago and she was talking about being on stage and she said, don't jip me on something. Like she was telling a story and said something about she didn't want to get jipped. And someone came up to her later and said, actually, that's, that's slander towards people that consider themselves gypsies. It's saying that they will always rip you off. And that's what it comes from. And she talks about her experience and how much she had to go within to really go, okay, what do I need to upgrade here? And there's these little pieces in our language left over from colonialism, left over from white supremacy that have found their way into our normal way of living that don't fit anymore. Yeah, it's true. And, um, and the thing that uh, we can all be grateful for is people who will tell us. Yes. Because we all just kind of keep each other half asleep. You know, you say stuff, I say stuff, and it's, you know, like I'll pretend you're blind. You're not blind if you pretend that I'm not deaf. And we all just sort of, you know, kind of stay in our ignorance around, around something. Isn't that interesting? Look at that story I just told. I'll pretend you're not blind if you'll pretend that I'm not deaf. Like, what's that about, right? Why did I say that even? Um, but I think we keep each other um, asleep by letting each other get away with things. So with, when somebody says to you or me, that's not cool for these reasons, and now I've just caught myself on that other one, I need to explore that one. 
um, we get an opportunity to, you get over that initial embarrassment of thinking, what, what, what was I thinking or what really? And sometimes that embarrassment is accompanied by some denial, some defensiveness. But then on the other side of that is, mm, wow, that's new. Never thought of it like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it, being willing to, being willing to ask hard questions can also help us be, something in what you just said made me think of this, can also help us to be a lot more connected to people that we otherwise may not be. I was having a conversation with a man recently, a black man, and he was telling me how his grandfather was a, was in the special forces. He was Navy SEAL. And I went, your grandfather. So that must've been like the forties, fifties. Right. And he said, yeah. I said, what was that experience like? And he said, it, it was intense. If you've ever seen a few good men, it was kind of like that for him. And I haven't seen it in years, but we were able to have these, this really intense conversation in a short amount of time because I asked this thing that most people wouldn't ask. And we didn't know each other very well. It's, it was kind of in this passing moment, but we were able to deeply connect around this shared conversation because I was willing to ask a question that other people might say, well, I don't want to offend. And I didn't in any way make an offense. I think our intention matters. That's true. Our intention matters. And our, I mean, that, that, question that you asked him uh is it it moves me even in hearing you explain it mm -hmm. in another situation because when somebody says to somebody else what was that experience like or what is that experience like for you in the moment listening to the answer this is a rare and magnificent gift because we assume that we know what other people's experience is. And we don't, we don't. And, and to your point about language, we don't even know what we each mean by, I don't know if you, since you were talking about Brené Brown, let's, you know, what does shame feel like to you? What does guilt feel like? to you it's a and then listening to the answer oh my gosh that is a really that's a that's a conversation yeah yeah and you know Br talking about Brene Brown her recent book Atlas of the Heart is a beautiful book and she I met the part towards it's in the beginning where she's distinguishing between envy and jealousy which is such a tight distinction have you listened to the book? I have. I've, I've read I'm it. reading. I'm reading it. And awesome. that that chapter also really, really struck me. Yes, because it's so, it's so. Um, you really have to dig in. You really have to dig in. And for me, what's so fascinating about language and understanding it, and understanding how we all have these different in interpretations of words and phrases based on our own personal context and how we view reality is then the next step is what's my impact? Yeah. Yeah. And so I know that's one of the things that lights you up recently. So let's talk about what is impact? What is impact to you? Mm -hmm. How? Um. I'm st my mind's still on envy and jealousy, uh, <laughs> and so I'm 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 settling into this question. Um, I'll tell you how it looks to me right now, Christina, and it might look different tomorrow. I mean, it probably will. Um, there are some things that are up to me, and there are some things that are not up to me. Mm -hmm. And impact is one of the things that isn't up to me. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you kind of why I've, why it looks like that to me right now. And then, and then I'd love to unpack this a little bit. Um, I was having 
you know, I used to run big businesses and I used to be very, very um, pleased with myself, you know, and I used to speak at very big, you know, I used to speak to my company and I had, you know, 10, 15,000 people working for me at different times. And I, I used to think that that was big, you know, standing on a stage, talking to all those people and running this big company, you know, and we established big by a number of people and amount of money and whatever. And I decided a couple of years ago that I wanted to uh, really get interested in leadership and what it takes to lead with love. We can make it more complex than that, but that's how it looks right now. And, uh, and by the way, aren't the seagulls fabulous? You can they are. They <laughs> are. I'm like, I'm just imagining that you're on a boat and that's just, in the, yeah, it's beautiful. I'm not on a boat, but I'm right next to the sea. <laughs> and um, and I, so I started to learn to be a coach and I was coaching somebody like this one-on-one and I suddenly had this huge insight that I had made up a story that one-on-one was less impactful, less important than one on 10,000 or one on a thousand or whatever. And that that's completely not true, that that's completely made up. If I um, genuinely get, and that at some level we are all one, And you and I have both had the experience where we had a conversation with somebody in passing, forgot about it completely. And 10 years later, they came to us and said, you know, you had that conversation with me and it changed my life. It changed something in me. And then there've been other times when we've done things that we thought were very, 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 very significant. And there's no evidence for that significance, you know, a year later or or 10 years later. And so I don't know how it works. And I also know that um, it doesn't serve me to spend too much time thinking about it. I do what occurs to me and then it'll be what it'll be. Hmm. I like- and I have some clients who don't like that at all and they are very earnest and intense and they tell me I want a job that's got purpose and da 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 And that energy... It's kind of a weird blocker. It's like, oh, it's so, it's when we bring that sense of urgency. Um, I think it, I think it, it can get in the way. Mm. I hear when you're sharing that, I hear ego. And I think those of us that are ambitious can have a, a super dose of ego. I was listening to your TED talk before we came on today, and I loved how you talked about the hero, being the hero. And I remember probably mm, six years, six or seven years ago now, I read Codependent No More by Melody Beattie. Have you ever read that one? No. It's an excellent book about codependency. And I always, up until I read that, I had always thought about codependency as being a victim. But I hadn't thought about the other side of that equation and being the hero and always wanting to fix, always wanting to save, always wanting to have the last word, wanting, wanting to be the hero, the savior. And I, ref- I reflected on that and flashed back on that when I was listening to your TED Talk and watching it and thinking, oh, I can resonate with that so well. And when I'm pulling out my superwoman cape and want to save someone, I know that I'm in that mode and I am in ego and I am in wanting to have the answers. And that that's, that's a place I have to be very careful when I stand there because it's not going to come from the deepest place of presence and mindfulness and love. It comes from fear. Yeah. 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 And as I hear you say that, I, I notice myself softening inside because, bless us, you know, we try so hard to to move our little imaginary chess pieces around an imaginary board with an imaginary enemy and an imaginary winning strategy. And then when we 
when we really see what we're doing and we settle back into just being in the flow of this extraordinary thing that we call life, this experiment, oh, something new occurs, something new. We see something new and there's something fresh and then off we go again. Right. And I, I almost hear a distinction or worthy of a distinction in what you were sharing about impact. I hear potentially, and I'm curious on your thoughts, influence versus impact, like wanting to have an influence instead of necessarily wanting to have an impact. Because when I talk to people about impact, I, I actually say the opposite. So now I'm really curious where this is going to go. I tell people the only thing we can control is our impact on others. But in hearing what you're saying, I can absolutely see we, we, and I, I follow it with, we can't control how someone is going to take it. We can't control how it's going to land for someone, but we can be aware of our impact by saying something and then seeing how does this land for you? Does that answer your question or does, how do you feel when I say it that way? And checking in and getting a reading on that, which takes it out of being influenced and wanting to influence others and wanting to really be clear about how I'm impacting. So what are your thoughts? <laughs> nah. This is a great conversation. All of them. Yeah, yeah. It's such a great conversation because um, it, 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 can seem, it can seem slippery. Um, and it, and it can also seem really clear. So I, I, I'll, I'll kind of have a go at how it looks to me. Um, I can't control how you see your world at all. And so, um, the best that I can do is show up and respond to what shows up in this space that you and I have and what happens happens. And the more settled I am in this space, <clears throat> the more likely it is that something special might happen. So settled is kind of a thing that I, mm. that I, I, I kind of, I notice and I like to kind of come from a settled place and I can feel the difference in me. Like I can feel the difference in my body can feel it when my mind settles and I can really see you. And as I see you, love, love arises. It has to, it always does, whoever you are. And so this, in this space, who knows what happens. And if I'm trying to strategize impact influence, I'm, I'm screwed from the beginning because I'm not actually here. I'm just, I'm just, right. you know, in the noise in my head. But the point that you're making is an ongoing inquiry for me around privilege and around being a white South African woman of the apartheid era, which is, of course, you know, has been a really interesting and humbling journey and is still full of privilege and, and, and bullshit in my head because I lived 25 years in South Africa. And I learned a bunch of ways of being uh, that <laughs> I noticed yet again when I went back to South Africa a couple of months back to see my family and so on. Um, you know, I, I, I won the lottery when I got born. And uh, I, I can't do anything about that, the fact that I won the lottery. I mean, that, that, that's the the privilege of my, the fact that I was, that I'm a white woman. And so there are things that I say and, and the way, and there are ways that I see the world that, uh, that are, you know, often blind and, and ignorant and ill-informed. Right. And so taking responsibility for that kind of impact is just an ongoing journey for me, man. I'm constantly finding myself 
learning new things about assumptions that I'm making. You know, everything from uh, gender assumptions, color assumptions, language assumptions. And you were talking in uh, your podcast with Bia Link about Hofstetter and about the way that different cultures operate. Um, you know, I have made so many blunders uh, in assuming things about cultures. Mm. Um, and it's a sort of a subtle dance of, of not getting guilty about it, but getting over myself, learning and moving on and being better around really understanding the experience of another person as best as I can. Coming back to that earlier conversation that, you know, where you had with that guy is settling enough to to get in tune with the experience of the other person is an invitation and perhaps a responsibility too. Right. How much did your, I mean, I'm sure that the answer is going to be a lot, but I would love to hear the more extrapolated version. How much has you having lived in other countries impacted how you relate to people on an individual basis in different cultures? Yeah, it's, um, it's obviously difficult to answer because I never didn't do that. <laughs> uh, there's a really great HBR article for anybody who's interested um, of a couple of years ago, which actually identifies the benefit of living in another country. Um, and interestingly, it, uh, it proves with all sorts of good scientific um, methods that living in at least one other place which is completely different from the place that grew you, changes everything. Because once you see that other people don't see the world that you, the way you do, you never make the same assumptions again. Mm -hmm. And I, I would argue that it doesn't necessarily have to be countries. I mean, I live in New York City and you know, there are many people in New York City who if they went to live in Alabama or Arkansas or Idaho, for six months would learn the same lesson as if they went to learn to live in, in, you know, in France or, or China. So right. I think being in a completely different environment teaches you something about things. And I think it's, it's very, uh, I think it's very noticeable for people who are not in the dominant group. So anybody who's trans or, or gay in a world that doesn't, you know, accept gay people, is living constantly in a world that sees things differently from the way that they do. So however you can mix this up, right. I think you learn this lesson of um, the world is not the way that I see it. And for me, that, that lesson, I kind of learned it, you know, in the other countries I lived. But when I got to China, where I lived for six years, a whole lot of assumptions that I was making that were sort of true in England and even France were not true in China. So that was like another, whoa. And then the biggest shock of, frankly, the biggest shock of my life has been living in the United States. <laughs> I mean, I thought that after China, that would be like, I could handle anything. I remember saying, oh, I lived in China for six years. Well, <laughs> everywhere else is going to be easy. And then I came straight from there to the US and I was like, whoa, <laughs> whoa, this is another planet altogether. So I, I, you know, the summary of the answer to your question is once we see that other people inhabit completely different worlds, the world views than us, there's a curiosity set of dominoes that I don't think ever stops. Every time you meet people, you, you, you have a new level of curiosity. Right. And I have not traveled to that extent or lived in another country, but I was born and raised in California and moved to upstate New York three years ago, which going from Silicon Valley and San Jose, California and Santa Cruz in an area that has millions of people to an area that's 30,000 and most of them are retired is a very different culture. I mean, I was looking up the, um, when we first moved here, there was a report done for this county and more than 
60% of the population did not have a high school diploma. And illiteracy was actually, is actually a thing here. And for me, coming from Silicon Valley, I was thinking that's, that still happens here in the U.S., like that, that high of a percentage. And I, we met, I made an appointment with the mayor. I wanted to know what we could do, how we could support. And I said, you know, people are um, in this town in particular, it's a very depressed area that hasn't really recovered since the 1950s economically. And I said, I, I want to help people here and I want to it, cue the hero. <laughs> I want to help. I want to fix this. And my response that I got was some people just like to complain. And I thought, that's the answer. That's the answer. And then I come back to my practice in ontology and my questions about leadership and how much I've seen it shift over just the last five years from this model of like the traditional leadership is kind of militaristic and this is how it's going to be done and I'm leading the charge to this more heart opening, heart forward type of leadership that's socially conscious, that's that talks a lot about impact, that that really wants to, you know, the rise of B Corps and the force for good and more and more cultural shifts because these large companies are embedding these processes, places like Google and ones like that or or Patagonia really doing things like that. Big, large companies that have millions, if not billions of dollars of resources and hundreds of thousands of people that they affect because those are the ones that work at those companies. And it's really fascinating to me how much we're affected as human beings between this intersection and interdependence, which I want to go into next, between companies and people. So in your TED Talk, we're going to switch gears a little because I want to dive into this interdependence. You talked about radical interdependence. And one of the things I often say to people is something I had heard from Dr. Dan Siegel. And he said, we've been sold this myth that we are separate from nature. When in reality, we are a self-organizing system. We are nature. Mm -hmm. And when we can see this interdependent interdependence that's happening where we're in a constant co-creation with everything around us in our reality, whether it's other people, whether it's businesses, whether it's nature, our life can shift. Mm -hmm. And when I started seeing things that way, I was much more mindful and intentional in every step I took, whether it was in conversation or on a hike, whatever it may be, how I recycle, how my mm. city doesn't, <laughs> and what can I do and what am I not capable of? So what are some of your thoughts around, in this now moment, around radical interdependence? Mm. It's such a great inquiry, Christina. And I, um, you know, I think there should be, uh, there should be a sort of series of TED Talks of what all of us who did TED Talks think about our TED Talk a few years later. Because, you know, mm -hmm. there are some people, I think, who, who, who do a TED Talk and then they kind of basically do a version of that spiel for the rest of their lives. And I think there are many people like me who do a TED talk and then a couple of years later go, what the fuck was I thinking, you know, or did I do it? I mean, I mean, how much, how, how uh, really was I, you know, what was I actually talking about? Because <clears throat> generally we talk about something in, in a, in a talk like that, that matters a lot to us. And it's often an area that we struggle with, right? So then I, I mean, I was talking about, the, I even called myself in that thing, a recovering hero. Um, and what I've seen now is, um, it is <laughs> that a lot of what I used to call collaboration or interdependence was actually not collaboration or interdependence. It was delegation. And I think this is a very interesting exploration about, um, about what is genuinely interdependent and collaborative and, and what is delegation. And I, I'm thinking right now that 
um, the difference is really about where the power is. Mm. So if you think about the Martin Luther King quote that um, goes, power without love is abusive and destructive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Um, this dance between power and love is in many ways the critical dance of, of life. And um, if you look at the traditional company, and you know, I was the CEO of multi-million dollar or multi-billion dollar companies for 20 years. Super easy for me to be collaborative because it was very clear to many of the people that if things didn't go the way that I wanted them to go, that they wouldn't have a job, but I would until I didn't, of course, you know, um, because the power in corporations is clearly understood and lives underneath the hierarchy. So then, or lives in the hierarchy, if you like. And so then we do these kind of collaborative things around with the real power conversation, not, not discussed, but present for everybody. So then the question is like, what do you do about this? I've been to many, many, many uh, events over the years where conscious businesses were talking about how to run, how to do good. Many of them B Corps. And it was great, but they were tiny. So does, I mean, if you've got, you know, 20 people and you're making sauerkraut or something, it's great. And you're 20 people. And right. how are you changing the system? So I think the big exploration for us all is how do we, how do we play in that game? And given what I said earlier about impact, I think it depends on what your history is and you know, what, where, where your interests are, which sort of soup you choose to swim in. And because I come from big businesses, that's my history. I speak this kind of language. So I tend to kind of right. hang out in that world and try to shift the way that people think about things. Because if you do see, as I do, did, I mean, I, I'm kind of taking the piss out of my own TED talk. There were a few things I said in there that were quite interesting about sort of seeing ourselves on a river to your point about hiking. Once you see yourself as genuinely interdependent and once you elevate the challenges to something bigger than you can do alone, you have a better chance of genuine collaboration and interdependence because you effectively have no choice. So if you can put yourself in that situation, you, you kind of are operating from your highest self. You're operating from your, your most vulnerable self, really. Because if you and I decide together, I mean, it's, it's summer here, right? I've been growing vegetables in my little garden here. And that is a genuine collaboration between me, the people that I love around here, who, who we planted, we water, we, we take bugs off and weed and all that. And the planet, the sun, the wind, the rain, the soil, all the magic that happens in the growing, no matter how good a delegator I am, those tomatoes are not going to respond to any of my blah, blah. That's the <laughs> right. collaboration, right? Right. So the more we can be in that kind of world or that kind of perspective with the broadest range of things, I think the better chance we've got of being genuinely interdependent. But I also think we need to be careful that we are not ignoring power structures. Because as I'm speaking, there are people who are saying, she's lucky to have time to fuck around with tomatoes. I'm struggling to feed my family. Right. And I'm working 18 hours a day. And I haven't got time to grow things. And, and so when I go to the supermarket, I'm buying the cheapest stuff. And sadly, that's often not organic. And it's often not even tomatoes. It's Cheetos. Right. And so, at, you know, so now then, okay, so now where do we go with that? And I think it's a kind of an invitation to meander through all of this and then kind of decide where you as an individual are going to participate in this game. I mean, you've chosen to participate in this game by having a podcast, calling the mayor, 
taking yeah. on some issues in your local community. And I'm sure that there are other things that you're doing. I don't know what you're doing about elections. <clears throat> I don't, I, I'm sure you're doing things. We're all doing something. Right. Um, so then the question is, is it a lever that's most useful to pull? Are you planting a seed that's going to grow into something interesting? I, I find the power dynamics really fascinating. And I find the delta between people that are just trying to pay their bills and then ones in executive positions or leadership roles, that delta is huge between the lifestyles of those two categories yeah. of people. And I know there's tons of uh, demographics in between all that. Like it's not just those two. But when I went back to visit some friends and family in California in February, I went back there for two months. And most of the people that I spent time around were people that have known my dad and known my family. And a lot of them work at Google and these big tech companies. So that was a lot of where my day-to-day -day conversations were. But if I went, I'm a total sucker for In-N-Out Burger. <laughs> it's a burger. It's, it's like a burger. Um, it's like a fast food like burger drive-through. Drive -through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they just have like five or six items or something. And then they have these delicious milkshakes. And I would overhear conversations when I was waiting in line, which were very different than conversations I was having during my day. And I remember overhearing several conversations where people must have met up from like a Facebook marketplace purchase. And they were talking about leaving California because they were tired of the, of the rat race and they were tired of being a cog in that wheel and they just needed to get out. And those weren't direct conversations I was having, but I remember thinking there are so many layers of this world that we live in. And I see that here in this small town where people are excited if they get $20 in food stamps. Mm. And I'm like, I just bought three books that are worth 30 and you have food stamps for that. Like that's how different our lives are when those are the kinds of things we're talking about. And I find as, as an ontologist, humanistic ontology is the art and science of being a human being. And those are the conversations I often live in. But you can't have those conversations with someone who needs to buy diapers and groceries and they can barely afford that. That is on a different plane of existence for someone in that state. Well, you can have a conversation with them. It's just a different conversation, I think. And I think, um, I think it's a really, you know, it's a really important conversation, this one, because, you know, I've asked myself the question, how do I, how do I, you know, get out of my ivory tower? Mm. Because by definition, I'm a 62 year old white woman who's been in corporate America and I'm, I, I'm in a what? I'm in an ivory tower. I'm straight. I'm cis. I'm English speaking. I, I, I'm, right. I'm, 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 hello. So first thing, social media, social media has helped me such a lot. After the Black Lives Matter movement kicked off, I really, really, really got curious about who to follow. Like all, so many people helped me like Glennon Doyle and, um, and uh, Elizabeth Gilbert and lots and lots and lots of people said, stop following me, start following these people. And so I'm following, you know, Tarana Burke and Alec Zimanon and, and Jonathan Van Ness and all sorts of people who are not part of my day-to-day -day world. And I learned stuff, man. I mean, I learned such a lot about I was just reading this morning about from ALOC about the prejudice of body hair. You know how body hair has been demonized by all, there's all sorts of really interesting historical racism and, and sexism around demonizing body hair. And it's a really important conversation to have. Now, I don't know anybody in my day-to-day -day life who ever even wants to have that conversation, but I can have that conversation by eavesdropping on it on social media. I can have that conversation by eavesdropping on it with the people that you have on your, on your podcast and other podcasts. So I think that social media is a really, really important, um, uh, it's, a, it's a portal that I don't think we should dismiss. Mm. Um, Second thing that I think is really interesting is the distinction between talking and, and watching. 
you know, if I, there's a lot of, we talk a lot, all of us, but if I use the test of imagining that a video camera is following me around, Mm. it's a really interesting test, right? It's the sort of the thing that you do, the things that you do when people are not watching, uh, you know, everything from what do you, what do you do when you pass a, a, a person sitting on the sidewalk in New York city with a piece of cardboard saying, I'm a vet, help me to what do you do when you step over dog poop that somebody else didn't pick up in central park when you have a dog and you have poo bags and why not pick up the dog poop and get over yourself from what do you say when you walk out of the bookstore and you see somebody who is looking at their food stamps what do you do and I think I think you know engaging in uncomfortable conversations or just go doing things that take us out of our little space are really important to to challenge ourselves to do then they're not they're not I mean, they, they don't solve everything, but they keep our, our, our minds and our eyes open. And it also takes the pressure off needing to explain ourselves. Because a lot of times when we're trying to work out what we're up to in the world, by the time it comes out of our mouths, it's already been through a lot of filters and a lot of practicing. I mean, that whole conversation that I just had about my TED Talk, it's really the first time that I've actually really said it. I've been getting suspicious about whether I was for real about interdependence versus um, delegation. And I've been really feeling uncomfortable about my own relationship with power. But as it comes out of my mouth, there's something new that comes. There's something new so that I see, and I don't know what I'll think about it tomorrow or the next day. But before, before that, there are all sorts of things that are going on in our lives that are not yet ready for discussion. That right there, that right there. And I was realizing as I was saying my thoughts out loud about this um, gentrification in a lot of ways where there's people that are not making enough to survive and then people that are making gross amounts of income and this the delta between the two the reason that can feel challenging to me is because my ego wants to fix. And because the people that are in the situations where they can barely make ends meet, there's a there's also it's it's kind of this intersection with ego and this thought of there is so much life can offer us. There's so much beauty. What is the headline of your life? And when people are stuck in economic or mental poverty, that they are, that they're stuck and they can't move and they don't have enough and they'll never have enough. And they're not, they are not enough. Like it becomes a part of their identity. I want to shake them and go, but you don't have to think that you're thinking that and creating your reality, which brings more of it to you. You are an energetic match for struggle. And so you get more and more and more struggle. But I am always questioning how I'm saying those things because one, it may not be the time for advice. Two, I don't need to sneak coach someone (laughs) and, and give my opinion without it being asked for. And three, I, a lot of times they're not in a space to hear that in the evenings I I serve at a restaurant. And so I work with a lot of other servers and they all have a story. They all have things in their background and it's fascinating, but we only have these little snippets of moments. And this part of me wants to stand and listen for so long, but I can't, right? I'm in this environment that's super fast paced and we're moving from one thing to the next in very short order. So I get these clips of people's lives. And there are a few people that the coach in me goes, well, you're, you're feeling stuck in that because you keep repeating it and recreating your future as your past has been. But that's not a moment for me to share that. So I find that being a leader 
does not always mean you need to open your mouth. Yeah. It means you listen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And you let your heart break. I find myself often in this situation where I will hear somebody in suffering speaking about something and you know how we can hear a story that's so it's been told so often that there's nothing fresh in it and it causes so much suffering to that person and many times there is no moment for for anything other than just an enormous amount of compassion with with our mouths shut just love and openness and again coming back to the very beginning of this conversation i don't know what impact that'll have you know i was having a conversation with a woman on the beach just the other day and she was telling me the story about her dog having been attacked by another dog and as she was telling the story i could just tell how all of the you know, indignation and anger and frustration and blame and everything. And I asked how the dog was. The dog was actually now fine. But the story of all of the pain and the blaming and the da, 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 it was, she had obviously told the story many, many times already. And it, and it only happened like a, a week before or something. And I, I noticed her husband kind of walked away because he'd obviously heard the story many times as well. And I thought to myself, what, you know, what, what, what is, what is there to be done here? And I, and, and I concluded that there was nothing to be done and it just to, just to stay with her, hear her and then say, I'm sad to hear that. And I'm glad that your dog is now fine. If I had known her better, there would have been options. If we'd had more time, there would have been options. Right. But in this particular situation, there was nothing to do except just focus on that one thing, which hopefully was like a little something, but just to really get that she was still in pain about it. And I, I used to not like these interactions because they made my heart break because I can feel her pain. And now I just accept, man, if my heart gets to get broken 10, 20, 30 times a day because of a conversation with somebody that's that's okay because it's better than the numb neutral slip on by right and i don't know what will occur next something might occur something might not but you and i having thousands of interactions in every week and we can't we we can't know but but I, i think i think i guess the point my point is just in general my willingness to be vulnerable to other people's suffering is newish to me, for me. And it takes me in surprising places. And that's the best I got right now. Yeah, yeah. And as you were sharing that, I was thinking of this question that has been top of mind very consistently for me recently. And it's, it's just a simple check-in of who do I want to be? right now? Who do I want to be? How do I want to show up for this? Yeah. What is in full integrity for me? And sometimes it's profoundly listening. And sometimes it's getting curious if I have a a couple extra moments and asking a question. So there was someone I was interacting with recently and this particular person is kind of always looking for an audience to complain about pain in their body. And they're a year younger than I am. And I said, why do you always say that? Because I'm a year older than you and I don't feel that way. And they were like, well, I've, I've worked in this, in the hospitality industry for 20 years. And I said, oh, you know, that, that makes sense. When you've done it as long as you have, I could see how it's kind of wearing on you. So what else would you do instead? And this person thought about it, kind of looked down for a minute clearly contemplating that question and said, you know, I don't know. And I said, what if you replaced, I don't know with, I know that I know what comes up then 
And they said, you know, I've always loved photography. I said, cool, sit with that. Let me know what comes up for you. And I just moved on with other things I needed to go take care of. And I thought that was a moment where I had time to ask a question, where I could dig in just a little bit more. But it's these micro moments that are so fascinating to me with people and how that has become so much more important to me, just a one conversation or a moment with a person than impacting them in a way that I've sparked something that creates change for their life because it's so ego driven. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Being right and knowing that I affected something or imp- or influenced something is like oh, just just rub it on me. But I have to remember that that's my ego. Yeah, well, yeah, and and then you will and you won't. I mean, I think that <laughs> one thing it's not you know just we are so remarkable when we notice it, it falls away instantly. Yeah. But I just want to say one thing about this, Christina, which keeps popping into my mind about the people that are actually really close to us. Um, I remember Carolyn Mace. Do you remember Carolyn Mace? Yes. I loved her and I, I still love her, but I haven't listened to her deeply for a long time. But she used to say, when we, when we get stuck in our stories, when we are the friends of people who get stuck in our stories, when we get stuck in our stories, but she was talking from a friend's point of view. She said, love your friend, your person enough to listen to them one time. Love them enough to listen to them a second time. And the third time, love them enough to tell them you'll never listen to that story again. And it is a really beautiful piece of advice because we, we've talked a lot about advice or insight generally given because we've talked a lot about people we hardly know, but actually there are lots of people who are very close to us and we hear them say that, you know, you can hear, we've all got these stories. Oh, here it comes again. And the question is as a friend, as a, as a trusted, loving loved one, whichever capacity you want. Are we genuinely being the, the kinds of friends that, that, that our people deserve? Yeah. And you know, that, that is an important, I want to dig into that a little more because I find it very fascinating how we operate with those closest to us versus people that are strangers. I find, and I don't know if this resonates with you, but I find for me, it can be much easier to feel like I'm being my true self with people I don't know very well than people that have known me for decades. Because those ones know old versions of you. They know old things that maybe no one else does, or maybe you don't share anymore. And it's very interesting, especially like our family of origin, you know, like they're, they know this stuff from when you were a kid and a teenager and all the different variations you've been through. And I find it really fascinating for transforming your relationship with those, those core people. I had an instance recently where I was able to do that. And, um, it's interesting. I don't, I don't always share personal stories on these, but this one was really profound for me in, since we're talking about this, my sister has been an addict for seven years, a heroin addict, and she's still an addict. And she had recently asked if I would send her boxes of food. And I don't remember if it was before or after I saw you in the inner MBA talking about, um, you had mentioned leaning into what breaks your heart. And I had heard that same question five years ago from Tara I Trent. I don't know if Glennon Doyle got it from her or whatever, but I remember hearing it then. And I went on a short retreat with her that was just transformational for me as a woman. And back to present day, my sister had reached out wanting these boxes of food. And a part of me went, I don't want to enable. Yes. Thank you. I don't want to enable this, but I also don't want her to think I don't care or don't love her. And I had to really sit with it for a day and a half before I even responded. 
Well, that's not totally true. Initially, I said no, but I can look up um, I can look up different resources for you. And then I reached out to my community, my support system, including my coach, and went, I'm not sure how to continue having conversations with her because I, I want to help, but I also can't support her, one. Two, I don't want to enable her. And three, I don't want to fall back on my old sneak coaching, advice giving place that she's not going to hear it. She, I can't talk to her about at the state she's in right now. I can't talk to her about high consciousness type conversations. She, she's not there. I sent her some things on self-compassion and she was like, wow, that's deep. And like, couldn't even have a conversation around it. And then I came to this place of peace that was, I crafted a message that felt like integrity to me, but I was still sad. And I thought my heart breaks knowing that you're in the space that you're in and I want to connect with you more, but our worlds are so different. It hurts. And that's why I don't want to even engage with some of these conversations because it hurts every time. And I can show up and feel the pain and love you and sit with my own emotion and still have boundaries. And my boundaries are that I'm not going to send you any money and I'm not going to send you food, but I will look up shelters for you. I will look up 12-step groups for you. I will look up food pantries for you so that you can go get your own resources. And it was the first time that I was able to transform a close relationship that profoundly. And she said, I understand. And it was... I felt it here. Mm. And I want to have more of those. And as ambitious as I am around business and wanting to create a, a global brand and a global company, at the end of the day, I'm a human being that feels so many things, so many things. And it's this interesting intersection of what breaks our heart with what, what the whispers are what we're pulled to that maybe doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, something tells us to go left that day instead of right or drink a little extra water because we're going to be busier or whatever it may be. Send, send a note to that person you were thinking of and then you find out they just got diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's this, there's, more people focused on what comes to us intuitively than I think has ever had a focus. And I almost wonder, especially if in business, we're moving more towards a feminine dynamic than a masculine one. I went down through a lot of different rabbit holes on that, but I I don't know about that, honestly, Christina, but what I know is the story you told about your sister is deeply touching to me for two reasons. One is the story itself of course and I send your sister lots and lots of love um but the second and the second is the miracle of how you got to where you got to which is here we are Hmm. she writes to you you make a first response and then it occurs to you to pause extraordinary wisdom comes through you that says pause then it occurs to you to reach out to people that you know and trust that love you and that know the situation wise people in your world and then it occurs to you a day and a half later to respond with something that is for you loving and boundaried right it's it's how we work and you and I don't know how she took it it's not your it's not our it's not your job to know that right but as you spoke about it there was a beauty and a clarity in the whole thing that's available to you yeah there's love and when when we tap into that when I tap into that deep love for 
myself, for others, for the interconnection of the entire experience, what comes out of my face is much more real than, than if I'm not coming from that place. And that, that place for each of us is different. And what I love about doing this podcast is being able to show that whether we run multi-billion dollar companies or we never have, or you're someone that has children and you're struggling with your bills, we all have access to the same things. And there's this idea that if you haven't had, if you haven't had privilege or you haven't had access to those opportunities, that you're not as worthy. And it's just, it's not true. We, we are all so worthy. And I love highlighting people that are at all different levels of life and business and expansion and, and maybe not, you know, but it's showing that it doesn't matter what our journey has been up until this now moment. We can choose what our story is. We can choose what we say. We can choose how we feel and where we're going to be and how we're going to show up. And to me, that's impact. But now I have a whole new, um, a whole new way to look at it based on what your thoughts were around impact. And I love that. I love that. So what thoughts are you having right now in this now moment before I go on to my next question? It just occurred to me that, that as you were speaking, I was thinking, yes, and because we live in the feeling of our thinking at all times and much of that feeling is invisible it's just kind of a it's a tape that's running we are often actually having an experience that we didn't choose because choice implies agency and I think it's a subtle, it's a subtle dance again. The way that it looks to me is that thoughts arise in the moment, and we have about 70,000 thoughts a day, right? They arise. And we make our world through those thoughts. And we, and we don't know where they come from, but we know that they keep on going. So if you just think about the time that we've been talking Things have arisen. We've had all sorts of emotions. We've had all sorts of thoughts. They've come, they've gone, they've come, they've gone, just like they will continue to do. If the sensation of sadness or if the experience of sadness is in us, it doesn't seem to me that we have a choice in that moment. We've created, it, it has been created in us. It feels like they, basically the thoughts are, and the experiences are kind of in our custody for a while. So the choice kind of kicks in later around, do I want to keep on thinking this thought? Right. But it's actual an initial arising in us. And I don't want to get too esoteric, but uh, I'll give you an example. We were talking at the beginning of this about envy and jealousy. Um, and I have started to see, uh, do you know Kasia Urbaniak, the woman who wrote Unbound? The other unbound, Tarana Burke. Oh, I was going to say Tarana Burke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. no, it's funny. Both of them wrote books called Unbound around about the same time. So her name is Kasia Urbaniak, really worth checking out. She's a fascinating woman. But I, I learned in that book, and she has online resources. Um, I learned in that book that envy or jealousy is a beautiful pointer to desire. So learning to sort of see it as a as a clue is a completely different way of thinking about it so uh yesterday i was uh i was with some neighbors and one of the neighbors who's who's a uh, roughly the same age as me walked in and i looked at her and i and i noticed the surge of envy I thought she looked terrific. She was wearing a great outfit. She was thin and her hair looked good. And I was pissed. Like, Rawr. I was like, oh my God, this is envy. Like, I want that. What's she doing? 
I know, why is she looking so great? It's not fair. You know, there, there was a bunch of that noise in my head. So I'm sitting there and she arrives. This surge of rawr comes into me. I don't know what I would have done if that had happened last week or last month, but last night I chose to go, oh, this is really interesting. There's something in here about um, maybe I want to get a little bit fitter. Maybe I want to buy some new clothes. Maybe I want to lose a little bit of weight. Maybe I want to change my hair. I don't know. Um, but the, I didn't have a choice about the surge of thinking and the emotion that came with it in that moment. What I had, where the choice sort of arose in me was afterwards. So now I'm telling you the story. I think it's kind of hilarious. It's like interesting what I, you know, will I do with some of the things she's doing? I don't know what's going to happen. But the reason I make this point is that when we think that we can choose, we often unintentionally head off some really powerful emotions at the past by being kind of removed. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about the beauty of leaning into where our hearts break because there's a purity to that. And if we go, well, I think I'm going to choose how I feel. I think I'm not going to choose to let my heart be broken. So nothing's going to touch me. And we've all been through that. You know, we've been through numbing ourselves in various ways to prevent that. So I just, I, I'm sort of seeing a lot more about the authenticity and the, um, the transience of being, as you said, who, who do I want to be? And you said the words, who do I want to be in this moment? Because the you that you were yesterday isn't here anymore. This is the one we've got. And by the way, the one that your parents and your family know from when you were little, she's long gone. Right. She's right. long gone. I mean, you know, and it, it's so interesting to witness, Lorna, because I used to, I don't know that it's significantly happened in like four years, but over the last few years, I've noticed because I moved back to an area where my family of origin is, even though I'm from California, they're the core of my family is here in New York. And it's to be around them again. I see certain things that I had grown up around. Like my grandmother has a full bookshelf and for years she hadn't read them. Now she's been retired for 20 years. So she's read them all at least once. And she always has a very full fridge, no matter what her finances are. There's always food in the fridge. In fact, she has three refrigerators. <laughs> so she's got a thing with making sure there's food. And I went, wow. So now I can have less in my fridge and it doesn't bother me. But it did before. And I also love buying book titles. There's so many that's that are always on my reading list. And when I noticed that with her, I was like, Oh, and especially because my partner hadn't met my grandmother before. So seeing her, he's like, oh, that's where you get it from. And I go, oh, wow. So you start to be able to see, like, I, I thought, wow, what a gift to be back around my family of origin and see these, these beliefs I had downloaded and these value systems and these ways of being that don't apply to me anymore. Yeah. And it's, it's such a beautiful catch because, um, you know, Ramdas used to say, you, if you think you're enlightened, go home for the holidays. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, you, you, and, and, but once you've seen it, it's like, oh, oh, so I have a habit of having a full fridge. Obviously got that from right. Emma. There's nothing to be done then. Because then it just suddenly doesn't make sense to you anymore because you've got a supermarket down the road or you've got a garden or whatever you've got. So the, there's nothing, it's all in the noticing. Yes. It's like an app, you know, you download the app. It's already got its like operating system thingy in it. It's like, oh, oh, okay, there you go. There's that, what that came from. And then where we get in trouble is the people around us, bless them, try and keep us stuck. They say, oh, Christina, you're just like grandma. You've got the fridge like that. And then you're like in some sort of bizarre story about something that never really happened about how you are and how you are inevitably going to be for the rest of your life. It's not right. happens. You know, right. you're, 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 you're arising every single second, every, every nanosecond, second. second, a new person is arising. Yeah. And to go back to what you were talking about 
choosing our feelings and choosing our emotions. I, I do often say that, but I totally hear your point too. And I appreciate that because I think it's, it's not either or it's both. And at least in my perspective. And I think that for me, I, I feel that we, in some fashion, we do choose our emotion and our feelings because we're choosing the belief that precedes it and the thought that precedes it. But I agree with, and I agree with you that in the moment, there's no choice to be had. In the moment, we can be taken over by that emotion. But if we're able to see it objectively after and go, hmm, that was interesting. I wonder what led me to feeling angry. I would wonder what led me to feeling envy and tracing it back to the thought that kicked off that stream of beliefs and feelings. Sometimes and sometimes not. You see, this is kind of fun, right? Because what I'm, I get, this is a really fabulous conversation because the way that it's looking to me is, I mean, I, I hadn't thought about the last night thing with the woman, the jealousy, envy, the, and, and it was envy, pure envy in the Brene Brown way um, until now. Because my, the way that it looks to me is because I know that we, I know, like I know that, that if I drop this, it's going to fall because I know gravity is what gravity is. I know that I am creating my experience in the moment by the thought in the moment. And I know that it's transient. And I know that this person called Lorna Davis is a made up invention. She is just pure potential arising in every moment. I know this deeply in, deeply in me. And then I'm living my life, doing my thing. And suddenly I will feel sad, you know, prickles behind my eyes, which I call sad because I can feel tears coming or I'll feel tension in my tummy. And all this is telling me is that something is happening in my thinking that is creating this. Now, sometimes I know what it is and sometimes I don't. And sometimes it's helpful to know and sometimes it's not. But the fact that I know that it's not going to stick around for a long time because it can't. <laughs> Because its very nature is to keep on moving through me, I can fully experience all of it if I want to. And I can lie on the, you know, you know that I'm completely passionate about rhinos. The day after every fucking full moon, I lie on my bed and I weep because it's the night that they kill the rhinos. I know this. It's the night that more rhinos get killed in the world. There was a time when I couldn't cry because I thought I would cry for the rest of my fucking life if I started. But I have learned that even if I try my very hardest, I get kind of bored of crying after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour. I mean, you, you, the body is, the, the system is not designed to cry endlessly. And so I cry and then I get up and I make myself a cup of tea or whatever I do, because that's how we're made. And that the, just the knowing of that allows us to, I mean, my heart breaks for your sister and I don't know her. I want to be okay with having my heart broken by your sister. Mm. Because I know I will not cry about it for the rest of my life. And so I, 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 for me, this, is the, the, this has changed everything for me. Because I'm, I'm not nearly as kind of controlly as I used to. Because what's the point of controlling? It doesn't work like that. What am I doing? I'm controlling something I made up. A made up thought versus a made up thought. It's not how it works. So now I'm full on in it. Whatever it is. Envy, tears, anger, whatever. That's so fascinating, Lorna, for so many reasons. But the, the first thing that is close to the surface and really present for me is that my journey has in some ways been the opposite in that I've always had so much access to my emotion that when I was younger, I would be overrun by emotion, overrun by a feeling. And, and so the thought for me that I can control my emotion by looking for the thought and the belief behind it reminds me that I am in the driver's seat. Ah, interesting. This is a great example. So if I'm getting you right, what you're saying is for me to understand 
that there is a thought behind my emotion settles me down so that I don't feel overwhelmed by emotion. Yes. This is what how it looks to you. Fascinating. Yeah. That's not how it looks to me at all. Isn't that great? I love that. I love that it's different. I do. I do. And like for me, it's, um, and it also stops me from trying to fix and trying to save and trying to be the hero because that space was so guided by my emotional state, by how I was physically feeling. It was a visceral feeling of wanting to scoop somebody up and fix them. Like for some arrogant reason, I had all the answers. Mm. <laughs> and I've realized since then that. Well, and, and to back up, being swallowed up by emotion led me to a place of spiritual bypassing, it led me to a place of good vibes only where I would, I could put on a smile face and make it seem like everything was fine and then go home and cry later and nobody would know mm -hmm. because I was just so enveloped, but it was a, it, it was an act. It wasn't who I really was. And now being able to integrate both of those ways of being sure there's times where I'm performing if I'm serving I'm usually performing but I say that I say I'll be your entertainment for this evening <laughs> welcome to my private party <laughs> and it's fun you know but it's not at the expense of my emotion and that's an interesting provocative way to live because I still have these feelings come through me I had a woman shared with me recently, a young woman, she's in her mid-20s, that she had 13 days sober from alcohol. And it, she was sharing this in maybe a seven-minute span we had around each other. And she told me she had lost her brother two years ago, twin brother. And I said, that must have been really hard as a twin. And she, I could see the tears welling up in her eyes. And she goes, you know, you're the first person here that said that to me. Everyone else tells me to just get over it. And I said, I would never say that to you. We all grieve in our own ways. And a twin is a very special bond that most people don't understand. And she goes, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you see me. And I went, ooh, and I felt this full flood in my body where I wanted to just hold her and hug her and say, of course I see you. And I went, don't get carried away, Christina, don't get carried away. <laughs> so I said all that, and I know there was a question in there, but I don't remember what my question was. So what are, what are your thoughts on all of that? Well, it's, it's interesting in a way that it, you, you said you used to pretend that you were, I think you called it spiritual bypass. You, you used to pretend that everything was fine. Right. And you don't do that anymore because you, you, you're just arising as you are. So you've actually chosen to drop that pretense, let's call it. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. And well, what's really interesting is my language in some ways has changed, but as far as the things when I'm talking about things I really love in life and what I'm grateful for, a lot of that language hasn't changed, but the place in which it comes from is very different. And I genuinely, I can, I can move my mood and move my state in a, in a second, in a millisecond. And I did not used to be able to do that. And it's so profound that I, I want to share it everywhere. And there's a, there's a key moment where my fiance's son was staying with us last summer, who was 19 at the time. And I was, I don't know, there was something happening that I was just on this total high. And I wanted to talk to everyone I knew about what they're grateful for. And I ended up running a room on a social audio app called Clubhouse for 31 and a half hours. <laughs> kept pa I wasn't there the whole time, but I kept passing this moderator mic over to new people. And so that room was open for a solid 31 and a half hours. And I was just overtaken by joy and gratitude and love for this community that kept this conversation going. And my son-in-law said, he goes, why do you want to push your joy and gratitude off to people? Like, what if, 
People have a right to not be grateful or happy or joyful. And we laughed at first because it sounded so funny, but we really, but he was serious and he was not laughing. And I had this moment where I went, you know, you're right. You're totally right. And that epiphany that we have a choice, that's, that's where the epiphany is. We have a choice of how we feel came in. And that's where that belief system de was developed was a year ago with the thought of, oh, you're right. We have a choice of where we want to be. And sometimes it's a subconscious or any, even an unconscious choice. And sometimes it's a conscious one. Hmm. Um, there are lots of places that I could, we could go in this conversation, but I'll go with what occurs to me now, which is knowing that underneath everything, all the pretending, all the ego, all the moods, all the everything, that we are pure potential, pure love, knowing that, like really knowing that, means that the freedom to show up in the moment is always available to us when we notice that we don't, we don't have to put the filters on. So it's like one of the things I notice about this conversation is that often the conversation is about what to do to change my mood or to do this or to show up like that. Or, but the truth is, it's what do I choose to not do? Because my real, my true nature is always there. And the rest of it's all blah, blah, bullshit on the surface. And if you come to business, the question is not how to be a, you know, how to be a leader that, that is loving. It's how to stop being one that isn't. Like how to stop being one that's pretending you're not love. And you can, you can uh, be in touch with, or you can allow the your true nature to participate in a conversation about the strategic plan or about um, a homeless shelter or about whatever you want. So it's all about doing less and it's about noticing who you are underneath all of the noise. I think that's how it looks to me now, you know. And so oftentimes when, I co when I'm coaching clients, business people, they come with their little, you know, can you give me a, can you give me a plan? Right. And bless, you know, because that's how we were trained. And then we settle. And then we notice. We notice that when our sister writes to us and asks us for food packages, we need a little time before our wisdom emerges. Then we notice that when our boss yells at us. We need a little time before we choose to respond because then our wisdom gets to arise in the, in the, in the present moment. It's always about doing less because your true nature is extraordinary. Not the pretend one, the true one. <laughs> yeah. Phew, that's such a relief. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned the doing, especially in this podcast because there's a lot of people that listen that are entrepreneurs creative entrepreneurs and people that are leaders in their companies and so the question is well how do we do this and how do we do that from my perspective that's those are things I tend to be curious about a lot especially people like yourself that have run these huge companies and yet it's so mm, reassuring and validating to hear what well, comes back to being yeah because i know this intellectually and i embody it as much as i'm able to at this point in my life and i am always finding new areas and my relationship to my own business my relationship to business practices to money to finances to these traditionally more masculine industries 
is very interesting because I came from this almost overly feminine where I would be consumed by emotion. And so I'm learning these other aspects that have been the challenge for me because stepping into emotion was not a challenge for me. Mm. It was being able to step out of it mm. and make pragmatic choices mm. from a place of calm and a place of being settled. And so hearing you come back to that is, yes, like there's this, this little voice that's going, we know this. Sure we do. Sure we do. That's it. So my final question for today, my final question is never one, it's always two. So my final two questions, if I'm true to myself, the first one is, what is your current growth edge? Well, I'll tell you the one that, that comes to me because I can feel the sort of slight discomfort coming into my throat, um, which is uh, noticing the messages that my body is giving me all the time. Um, I have, you know, somewhere long ago, I came to the conclusion that the body was something to be conquered, to be sort of disciplined and, uh, and managed. Everything from hair color to size, to health, to fitness, to flexibility, to you, know, you name it. And now I'm seeing it as a remarkable uh, barometer, a, a remarkable gift that not only uh, doesn't need to be disciplined, it is infinitely trustworthy. It's always telling the truth in the present moment. And uh, it's a whole new space for me. You know, I've been, you know, for sort of 60 years, really, I just, my body was just there to carry my head around, really. And now, I'm just gaining a new respect and appreciation for this remarkable body with all of its idiosyncrasies and characters, characteristics. So that's kind of where I'm hanging out a lot lately. Mm, that's beautiful. I, a, a brief, quick story. Well, I was listening to Michelle Maldonado last cohort in the inner MBA, and she references a study where they put the um, participants of the study in a space and they were told to win as much as possible. There was a red deck and a blue deck and they found at 80 cards in, they had full cognitive awareness that the red card deck was rigged and they couldn't win with red card deck at 80 cards. At 40 cards in, they had been reaching for the red deck a little bit less mm. and by 10 cards in they were hooked up to all these different uh measurements and their palms were sweaty and their heart was in heart rate was increased at 10 cards in when they would reach for the red deck what was so beautiful about that is it reminds us that our bodies are just this like walking neuron that is taking in information constantly and it alerts us and we've gotten so used to ignoring it and numbing it in all kinds of different ways and we spoke a little briefly earlier about um uh being it was something about identity and I don't remember exactly what part of the conversation we've covered a lot of ground here today but it it had me in a brief moment thinking of how I've been talking to people recently that it used to be if you were heavy, you were not considered attractive, especially as a woman. If you were heavy, you were just fat. But now the last few years with the rise of artists like Lizzo and, and this whole like body positive movement, it's actually becoming beautiful to be, to be a heavy woman and attractive and confident 
And that dynamic I've watched shift in my lifetime, which is so cool because young girls growing up now that are heavy don't have the same societal pressures on them that were there 20 years ago when I was a teenager. And it's so cool. And I hope to see more of that, but it was something that we were sharing and all of this, when it comes to the body, like really honoring our bodies is such a beautiful thing because if we, if we have our, our limbs still, and this is not to be offensive for anyone that maybe doesn't, but if you do have your full body function, how amazing is that? That our heart continues to beat and we don't think about it, that our lungs breathe air and we don't have to think about it, that our legs can walk and our mouth can speak words. Oh my God, that's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what's interesting on the subject of different people's experience, I'm learning that a lot of people are much more in tune with their bodies than I really even could imagine. And I used to kind of dismiss it. You know, my boyfriend is always telling me about like what his right foot is telling him or his body, you know, this is, and I used to laugh, but he's getting sensations that he's interpreting totally differently than me. And that's true of many, many, many of my clients. Um, And so I'm getting curious about that in a different way. And it's really interesting because it's not my space. It's not like I'm not, I just like, whoa, really? Wow. That's so it's a whole, it's a, it's a beautiful area, you know, area that was a complete blind spot for me. That's now moved out from my peripheral vision into the foreground of my thinking and my experience right now. What a beautiful growth edge. What a beautiful growth edge. And the last question that I have now, this is the final one out of everything that we talked about so many different topics today and so many different things, what is something that is really going to stick with you and what advice, if any, would you like to give our listeners that are moving through business or they're creating their business, or maybe they're leading a team at a large company? What insights would you like to leave with them? My teacher and my coach, Michael Neal, says advice is useless because when you need it, you can't hear it. And when you don't need it, you don't need it. It's true, right? When we're settled, we have everything we, we need. Um, and I guess that's the best thing that I would leave with is you are more extraordinary, more perfect, more amazing that you will ever know and hopefully you'll know more after this conversation and settle into yourself and and listen to your wisdom when all else fails I guess is having said I wouldn't give advice settle settle into yourself the snow globe is my favorite object you know this from my conversation on the inner MBA uh, when you put a snow globe down, it settles naturally. You're like a snow globe. Mm. That's a beautiful place to complete. Thank you, Lorna, for being here. Thank you for having this conversation with me for the podcast. And I hope the rest of your day is just amazing. Thank you so much, Christina. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Christina Crooks Show. If you'd like to learn more about our guest, you can explore the show notes and there should be information about them in there. If you'd like to reach out to me personally, you can go to my website, christinacrooks.com and learn about different offerings we currently have or set up a call with me personally. I hope that you take away some insights and some new inspirations, some new zest for life. And I hope above all, you have a really great day.